Hi folks, it's Eric Johnson. Uh, I hope you have a few minutes you could spend with me today. Um, I have a very interesting topic for the uh, seeker of God and the Christian as well. Um, it's regarding, is Holy Spirit baptism available today? So this is a question I'm sure with many people um, and probably not a question for a lot such as myself because I have pretty much understood what God has to say but I just like to share with you if you're interested in what God has to say about this and let's just use his word alone as we study his wonderful word alrighty here we go if Cornelius experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit why can't men receive the same baptism today while it is a fact that Cornelius did receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit as in Acts chapter 10, 45, and Acts 11, 15, and 16, the key to understanding why Holy Spirit baptism is not being replicated today is to be found in discovering the purpose behind the particular events in Acts chapter 10. Let me begin by saying there is no reason to deny that Cornelius and his kinsmen actually were given a baptism of the Holy Spirit as some have done in overreacting to certain denominational claims. The facts are too clear in this case. Holy Spirit promised to all flesh. Centuries before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Joel foretelled of a time when the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. The expression, all flesh, obviously is not employed in an unrestricted sense which would include every human being or even animals since they have flesh. Rather, the phrase all flesh merely embodies the two major segments of humanity from that ancient vintage point, i.e. the Jews and the Gentiles. On the day of Pentecost, Joel's prophecy was fulfilled and Peter quoted his prophetic declaration, see Acts 2.16, thus revealing that the prophecy was beginning to enjoy its fulfillment that very day. Since, however, only the Apostle, all of whom were Jews, received this outpouring of the Spirit on that occasion, one must look for further bestowal of the Spirit to exhaust the scope of Joel's prediction. Holy Spirit Outpouring a Baptism this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is metaphorically designated as a baptism. See Matthew 3.11, Acts 1.5, and Acts 11.16. Because it involved an overwhelming, miraculous bestowal of divine power. The final demonstration of Joel's prophecy to Holy Spirit baptism occurred when Peter and his Jewish brothers visited the family of Cornelius in the city of Caesarea in Acts chapter 10. The Spirit of God was poured out, Acts 10.45, on Cornelius, his family, and near friends at the time. Later, as Peter defended their acceptance of the Gentiles to the Jewish church, he identified the Caesarean experience with the events that occurred at the beginning, i.e. on Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2. He further tied the circumstance to John's prophecy of a baptism in the Spirit. He even called it like a like a like gift, Acts eleven, fifteen and seventeen. Moreover, the evidence of the Spirit's endowment was demonstrated similarly. Both the apostles on Pentecost and the Gentiles during this incident were empowered to speak with languages they previously had not known verse 2 and 4 and verse 10 46 what was the purpose of a Holy Spirit baptism the fact that the Apostles received a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the further reality that the Gentiles also were given a similar experience a while later does not mean either of the following they are that the same purpose obtained in both cases or that equivalent authority was bestowed in each instance. 
In fact, in each of these cases, a different purpose and scope of authority was manifested by the overwhelming reception of the Holy Spirit. So, why did the Apostles receive the Holy Spirit? The purpose for which the Apostles received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was quite unique. The background of this matter is vividly described in John's Gospel account. The Lord promised His Apostles that they would receive an unparalleled measure of the Spirit's power to guide them in teaching the Gospel in an infallible way. The Spirit would bring to their memories the things they had learned from the Savior, John 14, 26. He would guide them into all truth and declare unto them things to come, John 16, 13. The Lord promised they would be able to proclaim His message, unfettered by the need of personal preparation. Rather, gospel truth would be given to them as they required it. Matthew 10, 19-20 and Luke 21, 14. The apostles have no successors today. The gospel message is embodied in the sacred scriptures of the New Testament. These documents carry the same weight as the messages proclaimed by Christ's original disciples. Matthew 19, 28, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, and Ephesians 2, 20. There is no need today, therefore, a replication of Holy Spirit baptism such as was received by the Lord's Apostles. So why did Cornelius receive the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Spirit at the house of Cornelius was different in design from that received by the Apostles, though the manifestation of speaking in foreign languages was the same. There is no evidence that Cornelius had teaching powers analogous to the Apostles. Certainly, there is no indication that the centurion could lay his hand upon other people, thus imparting to them spiritual gifts, as an apostle could do. Acts 8.18, Acts 19, verse 6, and 2 Timothy 1.6. The purpose for which Cornelius was granted the Spirit was to demonstrate to the Jews that God was ready for the gospel to be offered to the Gentiles which circumstance constituted a problem in the thinking of the Hebrews. This was evidenced by the fact that even Peter initially resisted the idea that the Gentiles could become Christians, Acts 10.14, as did the Jews in Jerusalem when they learned of the matter, Acts 11.2-3. It was the miraculous demonstration of the Spirit upon Cornelius and his associates that turned the tide Acts 11.4 and Acts 15.7. The effect of this divine documentation of Gentile acceptance remains intact to this very day. Accordingly, there is no need for a modern supernatural outpouring of the Spirit to accomplish the same purpose. So, in conclusion, those who argue for a Holy Spirit baptism today misconstrue the design of that experience as bestowed upon the early apostles and then the first Gentiles to be admitted into the church. Holy Spirit baptism is not requisite to one's salvation today, nor is it a denom demonstration of such. It was a phenomenon of the first century unique to those circumstances. When Paul wrote his epistle to the Ephesians around A.D. 62, he affirmed that there was but one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5, and clearly this was water baptism, the rite that was to continue to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. So consequently, by default, Holy Spirit baptism is eliminated as a modern endowment.